it was very important for us to release Streets of Rage in the US. Remember that our strategy was to market to an older audience than Nintendo did, and Streets of Rage certainly appealed to that teen and college market. It was an action-filled game, actually constant action, easy to get into, and somewhat difficult to complete. And the great music was also really appealing to our audience. Hence, it was really important to us strategically. After it was successful, we wanted a second game, but because it had not been that successful in Japan, Sega of Japan didn't want to do it. It took a lot of phone calls across the Pacific cajoling and begging to finally get Sega of Japan to agree to do Streets of Rage 2. In my opinion, it was even better than the first game. Again, the fast action and music was great. It certainly was a huge and important part of our successful strategy to go after an older audience and differentiate ourselves from Nintendo. That was Tom Kalinske, the former president and CEO of Sega of America, arguably one of the most important people in Sega's history, full stop. He and his team are responsible for bringing some of Sega's most important game franchises to the forefront and obviously, as you just heard, one of those classics was the follow-up to Streets of Rage, quite possibly the very best game on the system and the very best first-party game that Sega ever put out. And that is one of the reasons why I plan to do this complete history one final time. My original complete history was 75 videos ago in this series, released on August 23rd, 2014. It was the third video I ever did, and honestly, I've come a long way since then. As Tom just stated, I missed out a lot in that last video, and now this is my opportunity to do it right, to do it justice. And, um, well, there has been one other change up since then too, hasn't there? Oh yes, Streets of Rage 4. It's not only here, but the reviews are coming in very positively. After this trailer dropped almost exactly four years after my complete history, I reached out to the devs to introduce myself and share my passion for this series, and one of the people that responded was none other than Cyril from Guard Crushed Games, who said, All the team watched your video when we started working on the project. It's great. I have never been more proud than when I got that response. The team who worked on the latest entry in the Streets of Rage series, one of my favourites of all time, watched my history video when starting work on this excellent sequel. Oh, so to all of the fans that have supported me since then, thank you. The people that worked on this incredible game, thank you. And of course, it's up to me to go back to the beginning once again and finally do Streets of Rage, the complete history, properly. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. In 1984, the incredible Japanese developer Irem put out the although rather limited by today's standards but still pretty damn solid arcade game that is Spartan X. More widely known as Kung Fu Master, this martial arts game is believed by many to have unknowingly started the genre that we're going to be talking about today. This game of death and wheels on wheels inspired game laid the groundwork for future side scrolling beat em ups and as already stated unknowingly got so much right considering how early it was for this genre. Punching, kicking, performing these actions whilst jumping and crouching, side scrolling your way through hordes of bad guys all so you can defeat the boss man at the end of each stage. It was a hit in the arcades and got ported numerous times on home computers and most notably the NES. 
as repetitive as this title was, there was something about it that really did grab players' attention. And as we have shown off numerous times on the Complete History Show, its influence went far beyond simply moving left to right, beating wave after wave of the exact same looking enemy. As we discussed in Double Dragon The Complete History, the video game Renegade had moved the genre even further into the typical side-scrolling beat-em-up genre that we all know and love. Taking the action to the streets and giving you the ability to move in 8 directions on the playing field again, this was progressed even further when Double Dragon itself was released, giving off the ability to fight your way through the waves just like Renegade, but this time with a buddy in multiplayer. By this point in 1987, it's fair to say that the side-scrolling beat-em-up genre was seriously booming. You couldn't go five minutes without a new title entering the streets. In fact, it got so overcrowded that the vast majority of its games just fell into the background, only to be discovered as the true greats that they were many, many years later. Yep, to truly stand out, you didn't just need to have a good game, you needed something more. For lack of a better word, you needed a gimmick. A lot of the time, those gimmicks are pretty obvious, such as a licensing agreement with a popular kids TV show of the time. However, the true standout titles didn't have this luxury. They had no choice but to push their graphical capability to the limit, and one of the best examples was found in the fictional town of Metro City, with the awesome Final Fight. This game didn't do too much more than what came before it in all honesty, but what it did, it did well. It stood out with its massive sprites and obviously all of the perfectly unoriginal traits that we all know and love by today's standards. You know, controlling stupidly strong players, fighting off stupidly dressed thugs in urban settings to save a stupidly curvaceous damsel in distress at the end of the game. Final Fight quickly made its mark, and the race to get the licensing for the title onto home consoles was won by Nintendo. Well, actually, they didn't have much choice, to be fair, with Nintendo's strict licensing agreement, and considering these were the good old days of Sega vs Nintendo, Sega was rightfully a little nervous. The Mega Drive, or Genesis if you prefer, had come out the same year as this legendary arcade title. And sure, it had a few more than worthy titles in the side-scrolling brawler genre. In its growing library, such as Golden Axe, Altered Beast, and The Revenge of Shinobi, it still didn't have its urban brawler. And sure, Sega got a good year head start on the competition and even longer for the majority of the world, but there was no denying that the upcoming Super Nintendo Entertainment System getting Final Fight as an exclusive was surely going to be a pretty big punch to the gut unless they did something quick. Now, to be fair guys, this theory has been debunked a fair few times in the past, whether, you know, Streets of Rage or Bare Knuckle if you will, was in fact influenced by Final Fight or not. And today, I want to give you all of the evidence that I can find so you can make up your own mind. You see, legendary Sega game planner Noriyoshi Oba, who originally worked on the arcade game Wonder Boy in Monster Land before creating the also legendary Revenge of Shinobi on the Mega Drive with the extra legendary Yuzo Koshiro, we'll be talking about him later on in the video, had already started planting the seeds of creating a street brawler game of his own. He was someone who joined the company a few years prior and before that he majored in marketing and statistics at university. Like many, Oba-san had seen the rise of the genre and in an interview with Read Only Memory, he explains where the idea originated from. After the development of the Super Shinobi was complete, I discussed with Yuzo Koshiro some ideas for making a street karate game. We looked at titles such as Double Dragon and Final Fight and used detective TV shows like Starsky and Hutch and The A-Team for reference. Then we proceeded to create the concept for Bare Knuckle. With all that said, it is also worth noting that in an interview with Asushi Siemia, one of the artists of the eventual first game in the series, when asked if Streets of Rage was made in direct response to Final Fight, he humbly replied, I cannot deny that it was not, but later stated, Actually, we bought a Final Fight machine and studied it a lot as a team. One of the other team members that helped with the creation of this upcoming game was Hiroki Chino, who was one of the eventual game developers after working on the aforementioned Revenge of Shinobi and the home conversion of eSWAT. This new A-team inspired street karate game, as he puts it, that would take on the upcoming Final Fight home release originally went under the title D-SWAT. And in case you guys are wondering, 
The D stood for Dragon. Yes, the original name of Streets of Rage was indeed Dragon Swat. Not bad, eh? So, in this eSWAT follow-up, you could play as... God here! Who is a white karate expert from Chicago and is definitely not a cheap knockoff of Chuck Norris. This character was eventually changed to Hawk in an early beta. You've got... Blackburn! A black martial arts expert from London who got a name change to Wolf in the beta. And then, of course, you got the necessary female entry, Pig Typhoon, who was from Hong Kong and was a master of kung fu believed to be inspired by Angela Mayo. Obviously, changes were made, and during development, all of these characters ended up getting well changed. Just like Sonic the Hedgehog's original design, these three characters and the name of the game in this instance was redesigned to suit a far more worldwide demographic. God Hand became Axel Stone, Blackbird became Adam Hunter, thank God, and Pink Typhoon became Blaze Fielding. And the name got changed to the incredible Bare Knuckle. And you want to know something really strange? Out of all of the three original Japanese box arts, where each game is called Bare Knuckle 1, Bare Knuckle 2, and Bare Knuckle 3, none of the characters have Bare Knuckles. Well, okay, Blaze kind of does in the second one, but she's got a bracelet on. You get what I'm trying to say. During the course of the game's production, and whilst Final Fight did eventually find its rather successful, albeit stripped back, release on the Super Nintendo, the team was still pushing to make the best game they could for Sega's 16-bit wonder. As stated, Obasan had already proven his worth and demonstrated how far he could take games when building them from the ground up for Mega Drive owners when he took the Shinobi concept and worked out how to make it a fuller experience for the home market. In his words, Arcade games you enjoy for 3 minutes, for 100 yen and they make you happy. On the other hand, home console games cost 5800 yen and have to provide gameplay for many hours without making the player bored. Never was a truer word spoken. However, this time he wasn't actually taking an already existing concept, he was creating something new, from scratch. Kind of. I suppose if you want to get technical, he was actually using a heavily modified version of the Golden Axe engine, unsurprisingly when creating this game, but still, he had a lot riding on this as his first true new game. And well, I think it's safe to say that he delivered, and then some. So with that, let's look at the 1991 release title, Streets of Rage. once a happy, peaceful place, until one day a powerful secret criminal organization took over. This vicious syndicate soon had control of the government and even the police force. The city has become a center of violence and crime where no one is safe. Amid this turmoil, a group of determined young police officers has sworn to clean up the city. Among them are Adam Hunter, Axel Stone, and Blaze Fielding. They are willing to risk anything, even their lives, on the streets of rage. The same way a Star Wars intro sequence gives off the feels to hardcore fans' this introduction, this simple wall of text leading into the introduction of our three playable characters almost 30 years later still gives me the chills. It takes me back to Christmas Day of 1992 and more importantly Boxing Day the day after where we'd all go round my nan's house who by the way had a seriously kick-ass sound system for someone her age. We took the Mega Drive with us, plugged it in, thankfully my uncle also got a Mega Drive the same day but not this game, brought his extra control around and we started playing this game on the killer 35 inch living room CRT TV and as it was a Mega Drive Model 1 we was able to plug it into that sound system too. <laughs> Sorry Nan, but no Queen's speech for you today. Wow. 
now for anyone that hasn't played it, you may be asking yourself, what is it about Streets of Rage that makes it just so, so popular? This series has become so well known that every single game in the same genre since, and even older games in retrospective sense, get compared to this series. Why is that? Well, everyone will give their own opinion on this, but if you ask me, it's simply the perfect blend of everything we wanted up to this date, released at the perfect time with, obviously, the perfect soundtrack. Streets of Rage and its sequels are the complete packages. Created for consoles from the get-go, they gave the perfect amount of variety in not only the three main characters, but also the stages themselves from the gritty, but at the same time beautifully neon lit up first stage, into the darker and more traditional back alley streets in the next level, onto the beaches at night, over the still in development bridge, onto the slowly rocking boat, into the factory field with its many, many hazards, up the lift, I mean, obviously games in this genre are nothing without a lift level, and finally onto the final stage. Mr. X's high-priced top floor never ending it seems mansion level. The game simply oozes perfection. Getting to see the streets in the background on most stages including the excellent slow reveal in the background on the lift stage just brings back moments of looking out at the nighttime sky at night when driving home in the back of my parents panda imagining that this could possibly be happening right now. Streets of Rage was intoxicating and it's always stuck with me. The bosses are all very unique and incredibly 90s at the end of most stages besides level 5 which is actually a reskin of Blaze and by the way, according to Samus-san, a different 5th level boss was introduced but for whatever reason was never included, which is believed to be the reason for the quick reskin. All of this however is perfect and worthy of being reasoned as to why this stands out along with the music of course, which I will get to. But for me, the icing on this delicious cake is down to how you can control the characters, especially in multiplayer mode. Multiplayer was always a big factor for games like this, hence why this game was reviewed so highly compared to Super Nintendo's Final Fight, that sadly not only removed the character, a level, but also the ability to play in multiplayer, it was Streets of Rage that arguably took this concept and smacked it upside the head to level 11. What I cared about most was the combat system, the strategic elements, and how it felt to play. The basic concept of the enemies is very simple. They move around in order to surround a player. So the key is for the player to move in such a way to avoid this. We developed a series of moves to enable strategic play. Jumping while holding allowed a player to vault over enemies to escape an encirclement. Throwing enabled a player to throw the enemy to either the front or the rear. The thrown enemy also had collision detection, so he could use this tactically to avoid becoming surrounded. Attacking from the back is a reverse attack that offers the player an option if quickly approached from behind. This varied combat system provided players with choice and, as such, a feeling of achievement. Couple all of these moves in multiplayer and what you have is something that's easy to pick up and addictive to master. Upon completion of the game, you get asked to become the right hand man of Mr. X. If you both say yes, you actually go back to level 6. If you say no, you fight Mr. X hoping to complete the game and get the standard good ending. But in two player mode, if you choose different answers, you must fight each other. The winner, if that's the person that chose yes, then gets asked again. Again, if you say yes, you go back a couple of stages, but if you say no, you now have to fight him. You are now on the way to the bad ending with the haunting music and the still image of whoever you chose to play as with the text, you became the boss, you are great. As expected, the game sold gangbusters and has been ported more times than I care to cover, with the Sega Ages release on the 3DS as always being the best. But honestly, pick up 99% of consoles released since Sega's console run and chances are it's been ported to them. However, in regards to proper ports, the surprisingly impressive Java game that came out in 2008 is worth mentioning, simply because it captures the game pretty well. Granted, it plays like crap, but still quite a nice addition if you ask me. 
Then more famously, you have the Master System version of the game, which does an admirable job of recreating the original. Sadly, it loses its two-player co-op, and you do have one boss that's mixed up compared to the original release. But overall, it's not that bad. In fact, I actually remember really enjoying this release as a kid around my neighbor's house back in the day. Surprisingly, Streets of Rage for the Game Gear is a different port than the Master System, and this one does support co-op, via a link cable of course. Sadly, a good chunk of the levels are missing here, and a few of the bosses have been mixed up too, but I gotta say, it really wasn't too bad to experience either, and they kept the music sounding really, really good considering the hardware that they were using. And well, I suppose now is the perfect time to talk about that soundtrack. The Streets of Rage soundtrack was produced by legendary music composer Yuzo Koshiro, a musician that originally had lessons from acclaimed film composer Joe Hisaishi, who would later go on to work for Studio Ghibli, among others. His influence in his early days were based on such video game soundtracks as Space Harrier and Gradius, to name a few, and by using an NEC PC-8801 as a hobby, he would attempt to recreate these tracks himself. Originally, the idea for Bare Knuckle was to create a heavy rock-based chiptune album, which was very typical for other games in the genre, but after visiting LA in the late 80s, he had discovered a much more upbeat electro-pop sound which worked perfectly with what he was creating on the PC-88 at home, with his uniquely tailored software. By the time the 90s had rolled round, Yuzo Koshiro could often be found in clubs listening to a lot of that classic house music that was all of the rage back then, from the likes of Technotronic and Milli Vanilli among others. He wanted to inject high energy music into the game itself, and when he tried adding this early 90s big beat house sound, it just fit perfectly. In his own words, For Bare Knuckle I used the PC-88 and an original programming language I developed myself. The original was called MML, Music Macro Language. It is based on NEC's basic program, but I modified it heavily. It was more a basic style language at first, but I modified it to be something more like assembly. I called it Music Love. I used it for all the bare knuckle games. Once I tried house music, it all clicked, and I thought it sounded really cool. Yes, it did. Although from time to time these tracks were a little too close to comfort to the tracks he took inspiration from... But yeah, I think we can forgive him. After all, if you saw Yuzo Koshiro's name on the title screen of a game that you was about to play, you knew you was going to have a great time. And for all of you people out there wondering, why is Yuzo Koshiro's name on the title screen? Why isn't it like the game designer or the producer or someone like that? Well, it's because his mum rang Sega and made them do it. That's a true story, by the way, guys. Anyway, on to Streets of Rage 2. So far in the episode, we discovered why the original game existed. It's popular opinion today as to which is the better game, but back then, if you only knew kids that had the same system, then you wouldn't even know that this battle of the beat-em-ups even existed in the first place. All that mattered to us Sega fans was that this was an incredible game, one of the best, a game that deserves multiple playthroughs with each character, and a game that constantly got brought out when friends of all ages came to visit. I remember it being one of the first games that I got that my parents were excited to show off as well as me. No matter who it was, as soon as you put that controller into someone's hand, anybody's hands, the game just clicked. And sure, I remember plenty of times back in my Amstrad days when my mum would come home from the chemists or news agents with some random game for me that cost her no more than a couple of quid. Seriously, guys, for anyone that's too young to remember or not living in the UK, this is how it was back in the day. All of this changed, of course, when I got my Mega Drive due to the price of the games. But from what I can remember, Streets of Rage 2 was the first ever game that my parents purchased <coughs> for me completely out of the blue and I think it will come to the surprise of nobody when I say it was obviously a very worthwhile purchase. 
The game was put into play pretty much straight after the launch of the original game. Yuzo Koshiro had really gone above and beyond and had built up quite the reputation at Sega, which was a good thing, as he had started to show an interest in creating his own game. His family already had their own development studio in place called Ancient, headed up by his mother with his sister doing artwork, and one of the team's first jobs was to create a port of the original Sonic the Hedgehog game onto the 8-bit Master System. This was obviously no small feat as the game was perfectly designed for the system it originated on, but for anybody out there that's ever played this Master System title, I think we can all agree that it is actually a really good spin-off to the main trilogy. And Knuckles, of course. Ancient had proved themselves tremendously with this title, as did another company known as MNM Software, who were another freelance studio created by Mijikito Ikawa, who had not only worked on the previously mentioned ports of Streets of Rage for the Master System and Game Gear, but also the always overlooked but still great GG Shinobi game for the Game Gear and eventually its sequel too. Yuzo Koshiro had built up the contacts with the top dogs at Sega due to that reputation and had introduced Ichikawa-san to the boss men too, and he too discovered how interested he was in creating a game of his own. At first, Bare Knuckle 2 wasn't the chosen game for the duo, but that's when Sega of America stepped in. It's been documented several times that Sega of America and Sega of Japan butted heads throughout the golden years of the company, and apparently Sega of Japan did not have too much of an interest in creating a sequel to Bare Knuckle at all in the first place. Thankfully for us, Tom Kalinske, the head of Sega of America at the time, and his team did want it made, and they heavily went against the idea pushing the importance of the series in Western markets, which is why Sega of Japan put two and two together and decided to let those third party companies merge up that already had experience with the first title and its ports to let them continue on with the series with Bare Knuckle 2. The collaborative planning of the sequel started shortly after and apparently only lasted about a week. And before going ahead it's worth noting that Ichikawa-san did not enjoy the original game. He saw it as nothing more than a Final Fight clone. And although I'm sure we would all scoff at such a terrible remark, he's kinda not wrong. That was the initial idea for the game. Yes, it's better, but when looking at it compared to its sequel, it is indeed a little bit bare bones. His job was to find ways to improve upon the original in every way, and to make it feel more like a uniquely branded product rather than a copycat. Thankfully, the sales of the original were so good that Sega was more than happy to bump up the production of Bare Knuckle 2 by offering the team the ability to create the game on a 16 megabit cartridge, which by the way is four times the size of the original game, giving them more flexibility this time round to achieve their goals. One of the team that took this in full stride was Yuzo Koshiro's own sister, Ayano Koshiro, who would create these incredibly detailed sprites in record speeds according to Ishikawa-san. She was also the artist responsible for newcomers like Max and Sammy, better known as Skate to us western folk, which she worked on from the ground up. But on the flip side folks, she was also the main person responsible for the loss of Adam from the first game. The idea was that if they were going to add new and exciting moves to this title, adding new characters would be the best and easiest way to go about doing it. And as these sprites were so much bigger this time round, they decided to go with characters that would be as different as possible to Axel and Blaze. Adam had to be put aside, but we did have him appear in the story. We thought, since he's not here anymore, maybe Axel and Blaze have to go rescue him? From there, we got the idea for his younger brother, Sammy. He was going to be the super maneuverable, tricky style character. Using him requires some skill. We designed him as a character who experienced players would want to try. As for Max, he's the power style. My brother Yuzo loves throw-based characters. You know, the characters who are hard to use, but when you connect, it's over with just one hit. That roster seemed like a good balance to us. Two standard style characters and two with quirks. Together, they managed to build upon the world that the original teased us with by providing a genuine attachment to the characters, especially during the 90s, with Blaze's hobby apparently being Lombarda dancing, which was all of the rage at the time, and how Sammy got changed from roller skates to roller blades, cause you know, it was the 90s dude! The team would compile cutouts from magazines and stick them up to help capture the style that they was going for when creating the game, 
and I think it's shown off splendidly throughout the entire playthrough, and not just in the characters themselves. These were not just the same levels we'd seen a million times before, these were locations that required genuine imagination. The way enemies interacted with the surroundings, the way certain levels, scenarios would change completely throughout the same stage was exciting to discover, more so than ever before in any beat em up. The biggest influence on that stage progression was probably the Contra series. Each stage in Contra is like, whoa, and gives a sense of a backstory to the game. It's not conveyed in words, of course, but I think you get a sense of it just from the stage progression. Every single stage gave you something exciting to remember, whether it was the diagonal path on the first stage, the motorbikes from stage 2, the pirate ship from stage 3, or the alien-inspired theming of stage 4. The team wanted to keep you surprised, and they did this by taking inspiration from a very well-respected series. Sadly, midway through its development after that initial planning stage, NMN's main guy, Mikito Ishikawa, came down with a terrible illness that pretty much stopped his involvement on the game from here on out. The illness left him bedbound for an entire year, and he was only given a year and a half left to live. Not only did this stop his further involvement with Streets of Rage 2, but it closed the doors at NMN for a short time as well. Thankfully, he did make a full recovery a good while later and has since continued to work in the industry. However, during those days working on Streets of Rage 2, besides his excellent additions to the planning stages, both he and Yuzo Koshiro played the early builds of the game a lot during production, and thanks to this, they developed a great relationship and understanding not only of the four main characters, but also the world found in the game too, which obviously helped tremendously when composing the soundtrack. This is why each track is not just great to listen to, but it reminds you of the settings during that particular moment in the game. Each track fitted each environment perfectly, and it really is one of the best if not the best examples of a 16-bit game soundtrack working alongside awesome gameplay and graphics. Kashiro san's classic jazzy house and electro beats were still here, but with the help of his old school friend Motohiro Karashima, they decided to go down a slightly more hardcore route than what was showcased before. By this point, techno music had well and truly started filling the airwaves, gaining its pretty sizeable following, and these two were very much into the scene, visiting even more local clubs such as Space Lab Yellow and recreating the music they liked the most back home for the Mega Drive with some friendly competition was what drove the title to sound the way it did, and again, just like the first game perhaps they copied a little bit too much. Yes, the rhythm, the rebel, without a pause, I'm lowering my level, the hard drama, we can never pin them in, you are styling, you know it's time to get deep. <laughs> yes, I think we can forgive them again. And yes, guys, I got both of these incredible soundtracks signed by the man himself, Yuzo Koshiro, when I went to an event up in London and watched them play this live. Oh, what an awesome night. Thank you very much, Data Discs, um, for everything you've done for the Streets of Rage franchise. It's incredible, absolutely incredible. Jamie Cook, the head at Data Discs, puts into terms better than I ever could why the Streets of Rage 2 soundtrack is so memorable. The music in Streets of Rage 2 is the product of a creative individual who was given the freedom to experiment. He was given the space to develop ingenious methods of drawing sounds from extremely restrictive hardware and achieved something truly special. Streets of Rage 2 is the product of one man's fascination with Western dance music, something very rare in Japan at the time, filtered through an Eastern perspective and squashed through a YM2612 sound chip. It really is one of the towering achievements of the 16-bit era. The game is simply the perfect sequel and it stands in most people's top 3 games for Sega's 16-bit wonder. Everything that was added made sense as well as everything that was removed. Gone was the lone cop car that would shower the screen with fire that for some reason only hurts the enemies, as now we have a new special power move that loses a small percentage of your life in exchange for a powerful and pretty much unbeatable attack. This was put in place to help continue to make Streets of Rage 2 stand out from the competition, and several other movesets were added to the existing and new characters that you quickly discover whilst playing the game can be a tad more complex compared to what was on the market before. 
of course, these moves are now most notable in the all-new one-on-one mode, which, by the way, may have taken inspiration from another upcoming game that the team were pretty sure was going to be a big hit. At an early stage, we were already convinced that Street Fighter would be popular, therefore, we were sure that if we added Street Fighter-style special moves to Streets of Rage, the rhythm of the gameplay would improve. These new stages would often get discussed in gatherings between the team and then quickly implemented on the spot to see if they worked. This helped get every single person closely involved and they all agree that this was the reason that the game is still to this day the full package. Released in 1992 and early next year for Japan and us European folk, yes, Americans got there first, the game was an instant hit and has since been released consistently since then and has obviously become one of the Genesis's most standout titles, only surpassed by such titles as Sonic the Hedgehog and, I don't know, what, Aladdin? Everybody owns this game, and for good reason. Not only was it good, getting great reviews, but Sega of America slapped it in front of everybody's face as best they could. You had comic strips appearing in Sonic the Comic, a Tiger LCD game had not long been out by this point, and of course, in true Sega fashion, you had the aggressive advertising campaign that was 30 seconds long this time, double the time spent on advertisements compared to what they were normally forking out. But then again, this could be because originally, Sega of America wanted to literally blow up a derelict building to promote Streets of Rage 2. That's another true story, guys. Bobby Engels has a problem. He needs to earn the respect of his peers. So he gets the special Sega Genesis fighting system. It comes with Streets of Rage 2. He saves $40. He gets more moves. He gets more control. Now things are pretty much okay. I said chocolate chip. Say it. Say it. Sega, Sega! Where do we start? How about his knee? That's his face. If that's his face, what's this? Just like before, this game got ported to both the Master System and Game Gear 2. And just like before, again, both versions play differently to each other. It's surprising how good the Game Gear version holds up considering the limitations and just like the game that came before it, it's a stripped back version of the original. But it's still solid enough to play. A simple yet rewarding experience for the hardcore Streets of Rage fans among you. And the Master System version... Well, that wasn't very enjoyable at all. The original was a conversion of a simple game, and this is a conversion of a game that had no right being on the Master System. It's hard to listen to, it's hard and most of the time frustrating to play, and as far as Mega Drive conversions go, this is one of my least favourites. Anyway, on to number three. How do you do it? How do you make another game in the Streets of Rage franchise that's going to make the big leap that number two did from number one? In most people's eyes, you can't. You see, from the get-go, straight off the bat, Streets of Rage 3 and Bare Knuckle 3 are very, very different games. You have no doubt heard this multiple times with Bare Knuckle 3 being the better title, and we'll get to why that is shortly. But first, let's look at what Sega was like during the release of this title that was released during the middle of 1994. The Mega CD, the soon-to-be-released 32X, and Sega Saturn had been filling the pages of every single Sega-related magazine and even promotional material found in the games too. 
Everyone's eyes were pointing to the world of crappy polygons over perfectly refined pixel art styled games and honestly, as hardcore of a Sega fan as I was, the release of Streets of Rage 3, which should have been right at the top of my want list, quite literally, wasn't. I had no idea this game was coming out and by the time I did, I already had myself a PlayStation 1 and I tried Streets of Rage 3 at a friend's house. The impression it left was... Meh. Look, guys, it's not bad, and looking back, it was definitely better than some of the games I was playing at the time on the PlayStation 1, that's for sure. But considering the original's job was to show what Sega could do against Final Fight and the sequel was to bring further life to the franchise at the height of the Mega Drive's popularity, this third title didn't really have a purpose. And when looking at it from afar, as stated, it didn't exactly have a big jump like the first two did, even if it was on a 24 meg cartridge this time. So you're probably thinking, what was the point? Well, if you ask me, Bare Knuckle 3 was the game that was made for the hardcore gaming brawler. You see, where some gamers may look at titles such as Counter-Strike or the Diablo series, if you will, as games that are made for a hardcore audience, it was titles such as Bare Knuckle that were being played by Japanese hardcore gamers in 1994 especially, considering arcades and even some home consoles that had moved to a more 3D based gaming style. Sure, 2D sprite based brawlers did exist, but the dedicated fans that played them were much smaller and far more hardcore than they were before. Couple this gamer mentality with the desire to make the title stand out over its predecessor and I think it gives a good indication as to what the team was trying to achieve with Bare Knuckle 3. The second game was so perfectly loved they didn't want to change up the look of the game too much but instead they wanted to expand it. The result, in Japan at least, is a title with an added storyline, an extremely hardcore techno and sometimes gathering fused soundtrack, robotic characters that electrocute enemies, an unlockable kangaroo and of course a flamboyant gay guy. At first, like many, I couldn't believe what they had done to my beloved series but as time goes on, you begin to admire it. This is actually a worthy follow up guys that makes enough changes to make it stand out from the pack. It's not to everyone's taste, I'm pretty sure everyone will prefer the original too, but put the time in and what you have is actually a very rewarding game, again, for the Japanese market. It's a lot shorter than before, just like the first it brings back not only multiple endings but also branching paths throughout the game too, and even though it's going to be hard to get to those stages, if you are the right sort of gamer when you do, you genuinely feel like this game was made for you. You got extra tricks that feel a little bit harder to pull off unless you got a six button controller. The entire game is a lot more grittier than before, losing a lot of its neon charm from the originals and unlike the originals, it's not very pick up and play at all. Both Yuzo Koshiro and Motohiro Kawashima were back again to score the soundtrack and by this point the competitive nature between the two was pushing them to create something that kinda stayed true to the original but at the same time injected it with so much energy as humanly possible. To many, the end result is an absolute mess. Even the crew at Ancient voiced their concerns, the duo regarding it with Yuzo simply responding This should be fine. And although at the time it caused a lot of controversy, in more recent years it's looked at by the fans as one of the most impressive, well before its time, and experimental soundtracks not just of the 16-bit era, but of all time. Factmag.org actually compliments the soundtrack upon its release of the Data Disc vinyl soundtrack, stating that it blends innovative, generative programming with serious techno innovation and accidentally preempted trance. We were trying to push the limits of game music. Both Koshiro-san and I had this question in our minds of what we could do with game music. We both decided we would try to do the most difficult thing in the sense of normal music. Like where you start to ask yourself if something is even music. Underground Resistance and Jeff Mills definitely have these points. Like playing the same sound over and over or warping sounds, making things super noisy. They made music that would question whether what you were hearing was even fit to be called music. The 90s was a really experimental time for club music. Experimental in the big sense. But also in that there were a lot of experiments going on within the music. I think we shared an interest in seeing what would happen if we took those kinds of experiments and put them into game music. 
So in summary, this is the Hardcore Streets of Rage that's the hardest to master. It actually has the most replayability of any game up to this point. It's the first time in the series that you can actually unlock characters if you know how, and it probably has the most depth too. Depending on the difficulty level, the game can be different lengths, and even then the branching pathways make the title probably the most rewarding entry in the series when you've finally figured them out. Sure, it doesn't have the charm or the character that the first two did, but I actually think that's what makes it so good. It has a noticeably harsher and grittier colour palette. It's not for everyone, but give it a chance once you've played the others, because once you do, the rewards speak for themselves. But that's Bare Knuckle 3 and not Streets of Rage 3. You've heard it a million times, Bare Knuckle 3 is far superior to Streets of Rage 3, and now I'm going to explain why. Honestly, there is just so much changed here, starting as soon as you turn it on. That lovely intro scene where Axel smashes the screen is missing for some reason, and it's believed that it was probably due to closer resemblance to Rambo. When characters play each other in the battle mode in the Japanese version, they end the match with a little bit of banter to each other. That was removed. Thankfully, they did fix the spelling mistake, mind you. The story has been severely cut down and censored compared to before. The voices change when you pull up your special attack. Thanks. For some strange reason, the Western version decided that changing the colour of all the main characters was a good idea from the iconic colour scheme to a brand new one. Plenty of censorship throughout, as seen on the ladies you fight, as during the game they're wearing leggings instead of having bare legs, and most notably the complete removal of the overly flamboyant, homosexually stereotypical character Ash, which you can actually unlock to play as yourself in the Japanese release. And besides this, you have a crazy amount of small tweaks too that just completely change the way the game feels. Certain characters can now jump higher than others, certain attacks do twice as much damage. When performing a special attack in the Japanese release you lose a significantly more amount of life, the life bars on the enemies vary between regions and the biggest change to the gameplay comes from the bosses. You see, the game is significantly shorter than the previous two entries if you fight on easy mode and therefore it's believed that the heads of Sega of America were worried that the game was just too easy, and therefore gave several extra life bars to each boss in the western release, stopping gamers from renting, returning and ultimately never buying Streets of Rage 3. In hindsight, for someone like me, the changes are actually great as they ended up making the two games very different and quite interesting to go back and experience. And nowadays, Sega thankfully completely acknowledged these changes by adding both versions in later released compilations. It's worth playing both, but of course, what you have heard is completely true. Bare Knuckle 3 completely wipes the floor of Streets of Rage 3. But still, I suggest you try them both. Over the next decade or so, nothing really happened for the Streets of Rage franchise besides the original game constantly popping up on compilations. However, during this period, endless attempts to bring the franchise back would be going on behind the scenes. But obviously, in every single instance, nothing ever come from these concepts. Firstly, Sega went to Core Design, who were most well known for the eventual Tomb Raider series, to change the in-development game Judgment Force into Streets of Rage 3. But due to unknowing issues with the developer, this partnership ended and it became the semi-popular Fighting Force game. Plenty of screenshots and gameplay of this prototype can be found online, and it shows that none of the original team were anywhere to be seen. The Dreamcast was where the next failed attempt was seen, and this time they went back to their roots getting Ancient, now known as Overworks, involved once again. But besides a few concept videos and a supposed short playable area, the reason for the cancellation was that Sega of America did not see the importance of the franchise. Games such as Fighting Force, among others, had proven that the world was no longer in interested in this genre, and therefore they saw no reason to continue working on a game that in their eyes wouldn't gain any kind of financial return. This put the game development in a limbo-like state that it would never recover from. Not long after this, Sega left the home console market 
and began creating content for the competition. With so many IPs under their belt, they ran a poll on their website asking fans to vote on what franchise they would like to see return from the dead the most. Streets of Rage came in second behind Nights into Dreams, which obviously did get a sequel on the Wii, but before that, Sega went to third party studio Bottle Rocket Entertainment and a new game idea began for both PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 with Marvel Comics legend Roger Robinson involved in creating brand new concepts for the game. But for unknown reasons, this version was scrapped too with Bottle Rocket Entertainment eventually going under. In 2010, the head of Sega for the time stated in an interview that a new game was being considered using the Condemned engine. All we know is that this would have been a sandbox type game, but of course it never went any further than this. In 2012, game studio Grimm were also having a stab at the Streets of Rage franchise. All we have are screenshots and concept art again before that was cancelled and later that same year, Ruffian Games were also discovered to be making a game with real footage being discovered this time too before obviously that was eventually cancelled for unknown reasons. Which just leaves Backbone Entertainment's attempt at bringing the franchise back with only four pieces of concept art being found. Thankfully, for the fans, while Sega constantly fell over themselves trying to bring this awesome series back, it was the fans that took matters into their own hands. With Beats of Rage. This title was pumped out in November of 2003, a game developed in 9 months by Senile Team. Even though the devs behind this homage to the Streets of Rage series using King of the Fighters sprites didn't actively promote the title, the fans did. By 2006, not only had it been downloaded over a million times, but it had been ported multiple times to work on many, many consoles. In fact, I even remember downloading this and playing it on my Dreamcast back in the day. Although by the time I did this, I think I was controlling a Marvel character. Possibly X-Men characters if I remember correctly. You see, not only did this fan hack prove that fans still did indeed want a new Streets of Rage game, but it also showcased just how nostalgic retro gamers were for the genre as a whole, as they created endless variations using the open Beats of Rage engine that the Senile team put out. You should know that we made it just for fun. We never thought that more than 10 people would ever play it. As stated, the game proved very popular online when it was released, as that very same year, Bomber Games started working on their own release called Streets of Rage Remake. You see, this wasn't a new title, it was a remake. A remake that some people believe is the ultimate version of all three games, as it includes advancements to all of the characters, extra characters, and more modifications that you would ever know what to do with. Personally, I prefer the originals, as the restrictions actually help it become a more refined game, but there is no denying that this is still an incredible homage to one of the greatest trilogies ever made. It was reworked constantly until its final release back in 2011, with over 100 stages, 19 playable characters, 64 enemies and a full 76 song soundtrack. Sadly, two days after its release online, Sega sent a takedown notice to Bomber Games requesting the removal of the title. Sega is committed to supporting any fans that take an interest in our games, and where possible, we do so by involving them in beta tests and other development, marketing or research opportunities. However, we need to protect our intellectual property rights, and this may result in us requesting that our fans remove online imagery, videos or games in some instances. It was obviously sad that this happened, but at the same time, without trying to start too much of a war in my comments section, you can see why. This wasn't a new game, it was a full-on remake of not one, but three games. And considering it was released in its final form 17 years after the last proper release, it was released right in the middle of Sega pumping out iPhone ports of the original games. Sega have contacted me regarding the download hosted on this site. While this issue is being resolved, please do not upload the game for others to download. Any links posted on this site will be removed. It does not use reverse engineering nor a single line of code from the original games. It's all based on visual interpretation. Be that as it may, it's literally the same game. I'm not taking anything away from it. It is quite literally a superb title with more meat on the bone than an all-you-can-eat steakhouse. 
but I'm pretty sure I'm not alone when I'm saying remaking three of Sega's most beloved titles and giving them away for free whilst they was trying to sell the originals themselves. Come on, even if they wasn't working on a sequel, it makes sense from a business point of view, right? Well, anyway, moving on with our Streets of Rage timeline, we get to August the 23rd, 2014, with the release of this particular video right here. Yes, my first ever complete history, where I stated the following. One day, I do believe they will make a Streets of Rage 4, although please don't let it be called this. And when that time comes, feel free to come back to this video and click here for my full review on that game. <laughs> Besides the embarrassing voiceover of my older videos, I was right. Ladies and gentlemen, it's happened. On the 30th of April 2020, .mu, with permission from Sega, published Guard Crush Games and Lizard Cube's excellently developed title, Streets of Rage 4. Now you may be asking why I didn't want it to be called Streets of Rage 4? Well, that's because I was scared. The original trilogy of games are some of the very best ever released and by calling it 4, no matter how good it is, it is a closer part of the original series than it probably has any right to be. Well, it's here and it is called Streets of Rage 4. The big question is, is it better than Streets of Rage 2? No. But I have changed my mind now on the whole number 4 thing because Streets of Rage 4 is indeed a very, very worthy title that I think does the name justice. Lizard Cube had already worked on the excellent Wonder Boy The Dragon's Trap game which in case you don't know is quite literally as perfect of a remake as one can get before working on this one. With this excellent title in hand it started development back in 2018 after the team watched my original upload, <laughs> oh my god a good cry with excitement thank you all so so much. Lizard Cube got to work using a modified game engine of a game created by Guard Crush Games called Streets of Fury. The game features not only nods to the original game literally all the way to the final level, but possibly more important was the team's idea of adding elements to the title that Ancient were unable to add the first time round. As an example, in the first stage of Streets of Rage 2, a car was going to smash into the wall, which you do see in its final state, just how Koshiro san and his family wanted originally and it's in this game. Not only does it provide a nice homage, but it shows that the team behind the game did their homework. This same innovation can be seen in the artwork, which may be a little hard to swallow for pixel heavy hardcore fans, but in Lizard Cube's eyes, this style was what would have been done the first time round if the technology was available back then. Most of the games from the 90s, which have a black outline in pixels, tried to reproduce animation, I believe. In some ways, if there hadn't been the pixel art technique, which was a technical limitation at the time, I think they would have tried to have this animated film feel, those very manga-like strokes and lines. Lines have been a bit forgotten. They're very important, and I like those lines. We lost them a bit with 3D and with current techniques but I think that the fact that you see them again here is also a tribute to what they were doing at the time. Personally, I love pixel art and I know that the look, the feel that you get from pixel art and that kind of grainy pixel art which is specific to Streets of Rage, it's quite difficult to recreate, but it doesn't mean that we have gone against it by trying to take it in another direction, while still respecting the style, the colours and the characters. I believe that it has allowed us to add a whole range of things that were not necessarily possible with pixel art. But it doesn't matter because you can actually unlock all of the old characters in this new game anyway. As stated, I still prefer Streets of Rage 2 and I don't mind admitting that it's mostly down to nostalgia. It's the perfect length, it has the perfect difficulty curve, the perfect style, the perfect soundtrack, there's no denying it's a 10 out of 10 game. Streets of Rage 4 is a worthy follow-up which does make some changes that even I will admit are improvements to the original, but at the same time there are a few tiny additions that were a little bit head-scratchy. For instance, the game is a tad bit longer, 
That's a good thing until you realise you can get to the end of a couple of the later stages in less than 5 minutes, boss and all, whereas earlier levels are the more standard Streets of Rage fare. Changing the pickup item to a different button than the punch button does indeed stop that annoying cycle of constantly trying to fight someone but instead finding yourself picking up and putting down a weapon. The problem is now that they've changed it to the same button as throwing a weapon, which means 99% of the time I chuck away my weapon in order to pick up an apple or a big bag of cash. Several bosses seem tough, which isn't a bad thing, however later bosses can be quite easy. In fact, I was able to defeat the final enemy in the game using Axel from the original Streets of Rage just by using my cop car special a couple of times. With all that said, I have put a serious amount of time into the game already and the benefits such as the combo system, the heavy emphasis on points, the ability to chuck and catch and chuck and catch your weapons, online play for two, couch co-op for four, endless amounts of nods to the originals, new soundtrack with the ability to unlock the older soundtrack, which includes the Master System versions too by the way, makes this game more than worthy. There is a lot of meat on the bone with this title and even if you are not somebody like me, you will end up finding yourself constantly replaying it with different characters until you unlock all of them. It's been so long since the last entry, so long in fact that many fans such as myself have all been dreaming about what the next entry would be like and if we would ever get one. Sadly, that leaves Streets of Rage 4 with the impossible task of pleasing everybody. However, put those opinions aside, people. And what you have is a game that actually is slightly better than what you would have imagined yourself. I've got myself the limited run release on order and I can guarantee that this is a title that I will continue to play for many, many years to come. And thankfully, that does mean it's safe to say that the Streets of Rage name still stands as the leader of the side-scrolling brawler genre. Wow, what a series guys, and what a time to be alive. It's great to see classic franchises treated as well as this, so that the hardcore fans that have made it so far into this video, all about this series, can come together and continue to build those perfect memories with this legendary series of games. Sega fans, these are the games that define why we love the systems we do. Playing as Axel, Adam, Blaze, Max, Skate, Zan, Cherry, Shiva, Rue, Floyd, Mr. X, Electra, Rudra, or Ash if you fancy, have resulted in the absolute best times with my mates. Chucking back a few beers and attempting to beat the games on Mania mode, which I'm still trying to do. And it looks like plenty more nights like this will continue for many, many years to come. Thanks to Streets of Rage. Streets of Rage was and remains an important part of Sega's gaming history. From the original game to the new Streets of Rage 4, players around the world have loved the relentless action. Like Sonic, the second game in the series was a beloved masterpiece, but it almost never came to be. The original game underperformed in Japan, and it was felt that a sequel wasn't needed. The situation in the US was much different, where Streets of Rage was a major hit, and we were relying on a sequel for a major part of our sales volume. A lot of back and forth phone calls were made, and numerous faxes flew across the Pacific to finally get Streets of Rage on the development schedule. It took a while to get it, but I think we can all agree that it was definitely worth the wait. The Streets of Rage series is a true Sega classic. Well guys, thank you all so, so much for checking out this particular video. This was an incredibly long video to make. Thank you if you made it this far into the video. Massive high five to you. Go down into the comment section, write high five. I'll make sure that I write it back if I see it there. Uh, hardcore passion project. I really do hope you enjoyed the video. I've got so many thanks to give. Firstly, obviously all my Patreons, all my YouTube members that give me the ability to work on videos like this instead of putting out daily clickbait content 
you guys are the backbone of this channel thank you so so much for supporting the show if you guys want to support the show as well there'll be links down below as i said earlier um you will let me uh, give me the ability to continue creating videos like this uh, so yeah please do consider signing up if uh, if you want to see more videos like this yes <laughs> Right, let's give lots of shout outs now. Uh, firstly, all of those musical artists that give me their uh, incredible music that I could use in this video, all of those links are down below. I want to give a massive shout out to Data Discs, who released the first free um, game soundtracks on vinyl and now digitally, which I highly suggest checking out their band camp. That music is insane digitally, so, so nice. Um, so yeah, all of those links will be down in the description. I highly suggest you go check them out. Brave Wave are gonna um, uh, be releasing Streets of Rage 4 on vinyl. You can go and check those guys out as well. And obviously Limited Run are gonna be releasing it physically in these beautiful box sets. Go and check them out down below as well. Uh, please do go check out these people. I'm not getting sponsored by anyone here. It's just I wanna spread this Streets of Rage love and yeah, let's continue to spread it so we can get a Streets of Rage 5. <laughs> right, and also down in the description, you'll see a design document for the uh, European and American version of the original game. Very few people have seen that. Take it. It's yours. Yes. Right, anyway, let's give a massive shout out to all of the uh, uh, people that actually provided their beautiful voices for this particular video. Firstly, Mogminer, one of my patrons with his sexy, sexy radio voice. Thank you very much, my friend. Uh, we had Alpha Omega Sin in the video. We had GameSack, Larry Bundy, uh, Down the Rabbit Hole, Matt McMuscles, Erin Plays, Ashins, Game Dave, Pat Man QC, Retro Man Cave, Grizzly, Top Hat Gaming Man, My Life in Gaming, and Kim Justice. A few regular names in there with a couple of people that I've never had the opportunity to work with, and now I have in this absolute passion project of a video. So thank you all for being a part of this video. Yes, and now comes the time when I need to give a massive shout out to all of the Patreons and YouTube members that literally help me out every month to create videos like this. With an extra big shout out going to. Gary Pinkett, Ryan Burford, Andrew Dalton, Asobi Quang DX, Jonathan Hayward, Christopher Turnbull, uh, Lipt, L-Y-P-T-T, -T. hope I'm saying that correctly buddy, uh, C64 Television, Kevin King, Aaron Gorman, Ben Jackson, Pretty With Horns, Jeff Mianowski, Elf Daughter Crafts, Richard Aldajik, Shadow Dial, Roven Army, Ryan Holtz, Retro to Next Gen, aka Lou, Dina, Robertson Dunn, Adam Lefty Taylor, Intrigued Gaming, Tim LaBonte, Tim Lunn, Conrad Constantine, Pretendo64, Creamy Elephant, David Yar Yaron, King Link Reviews, Brandon Gold, Aiden Wolf, Big Rico, Jeff Ladd, Mike Martin, RetroReversing.com, RL Sloan Friendly, Shadow Dragon, Game Apologist, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, Ye Old Hamburglar, Dan Petit, Lucas Softail, Ronnie Method, SSWB, Sonic's Captain, Nick Pollard, Bram Perez, Marcus King and Cup, Tyndall, Richard Carter, aka Fantastic Dizzy, Todd Paul Float G, Petty Mew, MZ, Jarvi Rocks, That Gamer, Dina81, Trans Rights, and Samuel Nielsen. A lot of people there help this show out and if you guys want to support the show then please do click those links down below, get your name shown, get your name shouted out, come and see what I'm working on see in development stuff that i'm working on as well which i think is pretty cool um and plenty of other perks that i'll let you guys discover on your own anyway again thank you if you made it this far into the video uh, and thank you for watching this is dj slope signing out and hopefully i'll see you all next time